Welcome to Wales Tech Week 2021. Thank you to our partners. Enjoy the session. Hello, everyone. I'm Sharissa Lugda, and thank you for joining the FDC We're pleased to welcome and we're pleased to host the session and welcome you to Delivering PMD Excellence as part of Driving the Electric Revolution at Wales Tech Week. This event is our morning session, the International Vision for DER, and that will be available to, to view soon if you weren't able to join us this morning. We'll be hearing presentations from Dr. Graham Bruce, Specialist Engineer and Lead Architect for eDrives at Rolls-Royce, and Jonathan Holm Holman-White, President R&D at Control Techniques. If you have any questions for Graham or Jonathan throughout the session, please post these to the comments chat and we'll get to them at the end. If you could say who your question is for, that would be really helpful. And if your question is for both speakers, then that's fine too. I'll now hand over to Jonathan Holman White to begin his presentation. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Anna. I'll just wait for you to bring it up. Great. So, uh, I, uh, my name is John Holman White. I'm Vice President of R and D at Control Techniques. Um, we're a company that's based in Wales, and uh, we specialise in uh, variable speed technology. So, I want to just give you an overview today of control techniques and also just kind of share how we are um, contributing to sort of net zero, uh, both in the UK, but also around the world. So we go to the next slide. So I'll start by just giving you an overview of uh, control techniques and our parent company, NEDEC. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about our footprint in Wales, uh, the fact that we're based in Wales and we have production here and we also have an R&D center here. And then finally, just to cover a couple of case studies, a couple of applications that, that we've, we've been working with and on um, that, that help. I think they're slightly different applications that are gonna just kind of give a little bit of insight into how our variable, street, uh, variable speed drive products uh, influence net zero. So we go to the next slide. So uh, just one slide really on NEDEC. Uh, I don't wanna to go to too much detail, but NEDEC are a, a multinational corporation uh, based in Japan. Um, they are, as you can see from the numbers on the screen, they're, they're a very large organization, but they specialize really in, in motor technology, motor and drive technology, and they're one of the biggest motor manufacturers in the world, they really predominantly with very, very small motors, um, the sort of motors that go in your mobile phone that make them for mobile phone vibrate and in games consoles and things like that, uh, all the way through to the very large, but, but their volume really comes from some of those smaller motors um, and as I'll show when I go into the history a little bit uh, we, we were purchased by uh, NEDEC back in 2017 so we go to the next slide so control techniques we specialize in the design manufacture and the application of variable speed drives so that's what we do that's all of what we do in fact um, we are uh, based in around 70 countries we're active in uh, selling our, our, our products. Um, we have sales centers in 23 different countries. We employ around 1,500 people. Um, and, you know, we have a large OEM install base. Most of our OEMs are the sort of small and medium size OEMs. Um, but as you can see, we have quite an expanse of, uh, of, of coverage uh, across the world. So you go to the next slide. Uh, a little bit on our history. We started in 1973. Um, three entrepreneurs started the business actually in England, but they moved quite quickly into Wales where they set up a manufacturing base um, and then later on an R&D base. Um, uh, I won't go through every detail in this slide, but really over the years, um, Control Techniques have built up a portfolio of drives, both in the DC uh, drive market, running DC motors, uh, through to the AC drive market in the later 80s and early 90s. 
Um, and you know, we've we've had some really uh, important innovations through that time. We were one of the first to do a universal drive, which meant we could run many different types of motors with one variable speed drive unit. Um, and you know, we, we've moved into various different markets in that time. Um, as I said earlier, we joined NEDEC in 2017, and then since then, we've continued our innovation of new products in this market. So we go to the next slide. So just a, a, a little insight in our uh, product range. So we build general purpose drive products. So we have, if you like, off the shelf drive products for many different applications. And I'll go into the applications a little bit later on. Generally, uh, this, is, this is how our lineup looks. So we have drives for the general purpose market. So that typically is things like fans, pumps, compressors, that sort of thing, where you know, there's a, obviously a lot of those used across the world. Um, and you know, our general purpose range fits into that. Uh, then we also have our performance drives and our performance drives are, are, are tailored more for the sort of motion and industrial automation market. So this is where you, know, you need some motion on your machine. You can set that up, it's a, it's a higher performance product. So it's, it's closed loop on the motor, uh, it, it's more precise. Um, and as you can see as well, it goes up to larger power rating. So we're able to go from very, very small, running very, very small motors, all the way up to very big system motors, sort of 2.8 megawatt size, sort of running in, you know, big, big mixers and that sort of thing. And then finally, we've got our, our servo range of products, which is a drive and motor combination. Um, and this is the very high end of, of dynamic performance where you need uh, you know, uh, very low inertias, you know, a lot of CNC and machine movement, a lot of axes, a lot of motors on one machine. Um, and so, you know, and, and motion is, is, is a very important part of, of, of the drive. So from one end, you're sort of running, a, 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 you've got your general purpose drives running constant um, uh, variable torque applications and constant speed applications like fans and pumps. And then at the other end of that, you've got um, you know, constant torque applications where, you know, you, you're varying uh, the control of, of the motors to do particular things. And then finally, we, we develop all our integration software that helps set up the drives and operate the drives. And also we have a, a whole suite of um, what we call our option modules, which, which are basically field bus controllers that mean that the drives can talk to various different machine automation field buses, Ethernet comms, that sort of thing. So we go to the next slide. So these are the types of applications that drives go into. Um, so everything from an elevator. So we have some large OEMs, particularly in Europe, where our drives go into, uh, into the OEM and into the elevator application. Um, and then cranes, which is a similar sort of thing, all the way through to regeneration of energy as well. So our drives can work as, as inverters, but also running a motor, but can also work in reverse so that we can, we can put AC back on the mains. And so we, we do a lot with uh, regeneration in things like the wind industry uh, through to uh, industrial applications like printing, metal, metals and textiles. So you can see a various coverage there of, of different applications that our drives go into. So you can go to the next slide. So just a little bit more in terms of, of the business and, and, and what we are doing in, in Wales. So if you go to the next slide. So uh, this is uh, our locations in Wales. So, so our main headquarters and our manufacturing facility is based in Newtown in Mid Wales. Um, uh, we've got two uh, sites in Newtown. One is uh, just for the manufacturing and, and uh, that's a, 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 um, a, a dedicated uh, site for mass producing variable speed drives, all the different products that I showed you before. We've got around 400 people on that site. In, on the other side of Newtown, we have a dedicated R&D site, um, as well as it being the main headquarters. So it has some other uh, functions there as well, but it's mostly for R&D. It was a purpose-built location. So it's set up specifically for developing drives and variable speed applications. And then we also have a sales location in the UK, which is just over the border in Telford, uh, which is predominantly just um, the sales for the whole of the UK. Uh, and then down in the south of England, we also have a, a servo motor manufacturer, which is part of the NEDEC group and also uh, work closely with ourselves, you know, developing the servo applications and that's control techniques dynamics. So we move to the next slide. So 
So recently, we um, we actually brought back some of our manufacturing from China, which is a, a good story, I think, for, for Wales and the UK. So um, we, we our highest volume general purpose products used to be made out in China um, through a third party. Um, but and, and I think we, we were doing that for sort of 10, 15 years. But last year, even through the COVID pandemic, we were able to insource uh, and bring those back to the UK which meant putting more investments so NEDEC invested and, and we put new SMT lines, surface mount lines in our factory. So we have a dedicated surface mount line now for that for the production of those products. Uh, and we also increased our headcount to 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 deal with the you know the increase in production. So you know I think that's a really nice story both for Wales and the UK. So we go to the next slide. Just in terms of our R and D, so uh, all, all our R and D on these products are done uh, uh, as part of uh, you know our, our development team. It's not outsourced. Um, most of that is done in the UK and done in Newtown, um, and you can see at the top there that's uh, our, our UK facility in the snow. Um, as I say, we've got about eighty people here in the UK. Um, is where I'm based today. Um, and then also we, we have some global team members as well that support that R&D function. Uh, we have some guys in India that support it and in China and in the US. Uh, our makeup in terms of engineering, uh, so it's a sort of 50-50 split between software engineers and hardware engineers doing the power electronics, the mechanical design and other, other lab testing and that sort of thing. Uh, software obviously plays a big part in most products these days. Um, we're no exception, so software is still quite a big part of what we do. In terms of technologies, we developed all our high-performance motor control technology, a lot of our motion technology. We have our own uh, solutions for that. Uh, we design our own IGBT, so the main switch inside the drive. That's the drivers for that are designed by that. We don't design the actual IGBT itself. That's third party, but uh, we do design the, the main switch um, technology for it. Um, or the driver technology for it. We are we, we use silicon carbide in, in some of our power supplies. We're, we're researching the use of other technologies around GAN devices. I think there's some talks on that later in, in this session. Um, uh, and you know, you know, a lot of what we've done, we've designed over the years ourselves. So we're very proud of the technology that we have um, to give us the best performance in motor control. Uh, we develop a lot of our staff. Um, we have quite a large graduate intake, um, both locally and across the UK. So, you know, that, that's a big part of how we're able to, to, to keep our, our uh, engineering talent growing in the UK. And our, and our facilities are globally approved. So we're able to do a lot of the CE marking uh, uh, testing that we need to do here in the UK. Um, obviously now with Brexit, we also, we also have to uh, conform to the new UKCA mark, which is pretty much aligned to CE, but we do all of that here as well. So move to the next slide. So finally, I just wanted to give some insight into some of the applications that these drives go into. So the first one, you don't need to read all the writing on the right hand side there, but this is a, um, a, an application actually in France. So this was the National Library of France and our French um, uh, sales center uh, won this business. And it was something that we did in conjunction with one of our sister companies, which is Leroy Samer, who are a motor manufacturer. And it was all about energy efficiency. So it was about uh, the National Library, uh, uh, you know, with their air conditioning, they had a very high need for air conditioning, a large building. And they realized that with the, with the current motor uh, and drive combination that they had, that they were going down to something like 50% efficiency in the winter and they needed to find out and have a better solution. So they, they approached Leroy Samer, they approached us and they basically now have a, a hybrid motor using a, um, a synchronous rather than an asynchronous motor, uh, which gave them higher energy efficiency. In fact, uh, I think they're pushing IE5 levels of efficiency um and then in that in combination with our drive which was not only able to run this particular motor but also gives you that uh, extended um energy efficiency as well so so this, this is an example i mean we, we this is a sort of this is sort of bread and butter really for our drives and motor applications but this is the sort of thing which um you know really 
it makes a massive difference to, to the carbon footprint. So we go to, to the next slide. So in addition to those kind of applications, we also do kind of a, a flip to that is, is more of a kind of automation type solution. So um, this is an application which uh, a company in the UK is working on, and it's about trying to take transportation off the, work, off the road and electrifying um, um, the solution of transporting uh, freight around basically. And so they're looking at trying to put freight underground in small tubes um, and they're looking at track systems um, to do that and you know we're, we're supporting them with with drives um, and, and the technology that comes along with the drives to to basically run permanent magnet motors um, to to control these 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 little uh, um, uh, rail networks solutions through these tubes and I think what's really interesting about something like this is it's it's using a drive not because of its energy efficiency can pay capabilities but to actually apply something um that is actually you know going to take transportation off the road and i think it's a really innovative idea and we're seeing more and more of this sort of thing happening in the uk with with new people trying new things and i think that's something that the d the der situation and some of the government funding is really helping toward driving and and we want to support that as a supply chain in the uk so that's the sort of overview um, of, uh, of, of control techniques and some of the things that we do. Uh, I think I'm going to hand back to Hannah now um, so we can, we can switch over and any questions I think will come at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for that great presentation. I'm just going to reshare my screen with me a moment. And I'm pleased to welcome Brian Bruce, specialist and lead architect for EVOs at Rolls Royce. Thank you, Graham. Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully the audio is coming through um, clearly for you. I'll um, make a start. Um, this afternoon, I'd like to talk a little bit about power electronics, machines and drives, and what it means for us in Rolls-Royce. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, uh, please, Hannah, and we'll, uh, we'll get a crack in. Great. So Rolls-Royce, who are we? Well, uh, we're an industrial technology company uh, we design, develop, manufacture and service integrated power systems for use on land, at sea and in the air. Looking from the outside in traditionally, people very much saw us as a mechanical engineering company, myself included in, in yesteryears, I guess. But right now, electrification and championing electrification is front and centre in our global strategy. And uh, I'd just like to reflect on some of our our products today and, and, and where we are today in that respect and, and where we're going. So our business is split into three sectors, civil aerospace, defense aerospace, and power systems. If we take a look at our power systems group first, uh, in this area, we deliver largely reciprocating based, uh, so reciprocating engines, sorry, based solutions for applications as diverse as agricultural equipment, just some of the world's largest land moving vehicles. One of the recent success stories from our portfolio here has been the use of one to four megawatt hybrid power packs incorporating energy storage and the um, high speed MTU diesel engine. And this has been deployed now on rail platforms and later this year goes into service on the Sunseeker 133 yacht as an example. If we take a quick look at the defense sector, uh, People may be aware that we're working on the UK-led activity at Tempest, looking at next generation aerospace defence opportunities. And some of the technologies that we've historically developed in this area are now seeing light of day in other applications, or at least some of that design learning coming through 
to other applications such as vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. Really interesting area and a really interesting time. Some people may not be aware we're also the UK's sovereign capability for the Royal Navy submarine fleet providing the nuclear power and propulsion systems. I won't go into any detail, but certainly seeing a trend of similarity towards electrification. These skills also represent an adjacency for us in small modular reactors for the civil nuclear industry, for example, as well. And that brings us to civil aerospace. So if it's possible to move on to the next slide, please, Hannah, that'd be fantastic. Great. So in aviation, there are really two major dynamics. The evolutionary, which is concerned with the development of what we describe as more electric aircraft, generally in the larger aircraft space, the movement of um, traditionally hydraulic and mechanically driven solutions for actuators and so on, being replaced by more efficient and flexible electrical equivalents. And that's really the space I'm going to focus a little bit of time on uh, as we move forward. But uh, just to mention uh, a really exciting area as well is the revolutionary and disruptive space um, led in our business through our central innovation hub and a really exciting time. We're involved in a number of projects, uh, too many to list, but uh, some really key ones coming through for us and some opportunities for entry into service as early as mid-2020s. Um, the, the, the market, though, is, is very uh, uncertain in many respects. We've got new airframe styles or transport um, platforms in development. Scope of supply could change. There's new entrants appearing in the aerospace market. It's fantastic. And the markets could also structurally change. So a lot of uncertainty here. But so far as we're concerned, we're in it. And we think these underpinning technologies are also a vital ingredient for our pathway to net zero as well. Before we depart from this slide, I just want to briefly mention the aircraft you can see at the bottom of there is Spirit of Innovation, which was developed uh, through the Axel program. Uh, working in conjunction with, amongst other people, Yasser Motors and also Electrify UK Limited. Um, so I saw Simon Hart on um, the call and, and Wales Tech Week earlier on. So uh, my regards in that respect, but uh, it's certainly a great achievement. And this is intended to take to the skies. It's been doing taxiing earlier this year. And uh, the intention is to maybe even break a few records on the way there as well uh, with a challenge to get over 300 miles per hour with this 400 kilowatt or 500 horsepower platform. So on that note, I'll move on and I'm gonna talk incremental technology now. If we can, lovely. So there's a couple of uh, screenshots here that I've taken from our UltraFan app. Uh, the uh, UltraFan is our next generation civil large engine platform. Uh, it's the same sort of size of engine. If we can move on to the next slide, please, uh, that you see for instance, on your Boeing 787 Dreamliner, which is currently powered by the Trent 1000, or on an Airbus A350, is powered by the Trent XWB. And if we just peel back some of the layers on this, let's let's have a look at it and its more electric uh, trend that we're uh, driving. So if it's possible to click one forward for me, when you peel back the, the layers on this, you take the case off, what you'll see is we've got this huge fan at the front, and that's job is to take as large a cross-section of air as possible and push it back as slowly as possible to maximize propulsive efficiency, all driven from the core of the gas turbine, uh, where we bring air in, we squeeze it with a pressure ratio of 50 to one, heat it up in combustion, and then expand it through the turbine stages at the back. To keep that going critically, and this is where the power electronics machines and drives comes in, we do that today using a gearbox which is sat at the bottom of that core and which really follows the engine speed. Imagine if we could unbreak the rules there and we could drive almost any speed we wanted to. We can put them anywhere we want. And that's really the magic of what I describe as the solid state gearbox or what power electronic becomes is, is effectively our gearbox. So if we're possible to click on two slides, please, uh, Hannah, if possible. Okay, so this is the more electric engine. You'll see we've removed the gearbox and we're moving the pumps to exactly where they need to be. So fuel pump is in line coming down from the fuel tank and on its way to the burners the oil tanks right next to where it needs to scavenge the oil and then pumped from the oil tank and uh, we're even looking at a dedicated air compressor uh, as part of this system uh, as well so 
what we're doing here is gaining multiple percentage points of specific consumption by optimizing how we operate the gas turbine cycle and some really big benefits to come in terms of lifing of components as well. So that's the prize. And the next slide is the challenge. So if we're able to move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is um, one of our engine controllers. It sits uh, on the side of the engine at the moment and its job is to make sure that that engine keeps on producing the thrust and control that in the way that's required by the pilot. So what we've got to do is we've got to take this electronics technology, we've got to take our understanding in the business of electrical generation systems and actuation systems and bring it all together into a fault tolerant uh, system. If our gearbox was to fail, it generally does it in a predictable fashion with wear mechanisms and so on and so forth. The nature of complex electronics is such that there is an unpredictability of failure, and that's why fault tolerance, being able to withstand any single fault becomes really important for us, and that's what we're working on at the moment. So if we move on to the next slide, I'm going to give you a little taste of um, some of our first-generation demonstration hardware. So this is working hard for us at the moment. In fact, I'm uh, coming in from Manchester today, where we're working with our university technology centres, um, and... Uh, we are using this equipment to really prove out the fault tolerant aspects of our design and make sure we can deliver safe, safety critical solutions. Um, this has actually got silicon IGBT technology inside, so um, not as racy as perhaps as some of the mentions of silicon carbide, but we have got silicon carbide in our midst and we really do think it gives that change in performance. Anyway, in the meantime, some of the other that we've brought into the this design uh, is the use of ALM, additive layer manufacture, uh, to optimize our cooling system. And this has proven to be rather effective in enabling us to get such a compact design. It's all based upon our uh, background intellectual property that we've been building over a period of time. And of course, we're working with our supply chain in the UK and new entrants and SMEs as well. And a lot of that, I think, is down to driving the electric revolution, which has really opened up our eyes to what's happening and what the opportunities are to work with some new people. If I could move on to the next slide, please, if possible. OK, so what is our approach? Well, we design once and we want to use many times. We're actually using the same philosophy as we use for our existing platforms in terms of our common circuit blocks and these actually take a single piece of functionality from an electronics point of view, capture that, and we actually develop that as a single entity that we can then drag and drop into other designs, saving us a lot of overall power on PCB. We see printed circuit boards as a real from A to B. I understand I might be struggling with a little bit of bandwidth here, so hopefully it's coming through loud and clear. Um, one of the big challenges for ourselves, of course, as well, is dealing with the excitement of new technology. And we really want to be using these silicon carbide devices that are coming through. But we've got to think very carefully about how we manage that over the life cycle of the product. We could place that first component today, but we might still need to be manufacturing this component in the unit in 20 years' time. And then that last one's going to be in service for another 20 years after that. So obsolescence for us is a really important uh, aspect to our design and full life cycle um, approach. Uh, on the next, I think it's possible to move on to the next slide, please. And so just to talk a little bit more about the environmental challenge, I have to say one of the things that I most enjoy about working in this area um, in the aerospace business is the fact that we really do go down into the nitty gritty of the design. It's so important that we understand and overturn every stone that could potentially lead um, to a failure or in-service issue. And um, in and amongst all that, we've got to accommodate the environmental challenge. So I've just put a couple of bullet points down to indicate some of the areas where perhaps we've got a bit more of a headwind than, than some of the other sectors that we, we might see. So vibration levels on the engines can be generally quite large. And you can see the picture here of a, an engineer who's uh, just preparing for a fan blade off test. This engine, a BR725 engine, is going to, um, which is on the Gulfstream G650, is going to have one of its fan blades uh, purposefully detached. And the job of the engine is to retain that radially 
within the engine to prevent particularly hazardous or even catastrophic events from um, occurring in this unlikely circumstance. When that happens, though, we could see back at our power electronics unit on the engine of the order of 200 G shock loads, and we've got to make sure that we can retain that on the engine. Um, in and amongst some of those uh, sort of more extreme elements, we've got to deal with not only high and low temperature extremes, perhaps beyond a lot of commercial off-the-shelf components, but significant thermal cycling associated with the everyday use of these products. Even when we turn the engine off, there's a lot of heat energy in this core of the gas turbine, which leaches out and we must be very careful with. In the event of fire or an overheat situation, we must fail safe. And then naturally, when we're in the air, we have a greater susceptibility or at least a greater prevalence of atmospheric radiation and high energy neutrons that can cause what we describe as single event effects. So that could be perhaps a power device that gets turned on inadvertently or some of our logic that gets flipped. And we've got to deal with that as part of our functional requirements. Um, to touch upon some other aspects, um, electromagnetic compatibility. Well, when you go up in altitude, uh, you reduce the air pressure and that gives us an increased electrical susceptibility. And then we must be able to continue operation even if the airplane is struck by lightning. So all of these things we've got guidelines, recommendations for, and we've got to take out the best knowledge in the industry and combine it with um, what we do as we, as we move forward and develop this and, uh, and ultimately make a safe product. So that's just a, whistle, a very quick whistle stop tour of what, uh, what's happening um, at the moment. Uh, we've got various engine demonstrator programs and uh, perhaps given a bit more time, we could dig into some of the specifics. But at the moment, I'm going to sort of press on, ask Hannah uh, if you mind moving to the next slide for us and just wrap up. So I, I'd, firstly, I'd like to say power electronics machines and drives and it's an essential ingredient and in what I genuinely think is an amazing opportunity uh, for the aerospace industry. It's going to be paced by technology and uh, I think we're um, kind of in it to win it, I'll say, and uh, really uh, pushing that technology development. Challenges do exist in deploying the required technology, but we've got good experience there. And the UK supply chain has a lot of experience in high reliability traditionally, and there's space there, I think, for new entrants as well. Uh, we've been working and expanding our supply chain and also leveraging cross-sector developments. We're involved now in a number of what might have been regarded as motive-led activities, uh, and they've been uh, opening their doors and, and listening to our side of the story as well. So it's, it's really exciting, I think, in the UK at the moment, and um, long may it continue. Uh, just to finish off uh, a few things, I'd like to say driving the electric revolution, I think it's been a fantastic boost um, for, for UK supply chain and power electronics and Long may it continue. And um, just a few final notices. If anybody's interested, our CEO, Warren East, is going to be speaking uh, this evening in an audience with influential Welsh leaders, I believe at 6 p.m. And then we'll also feature tomorrow on the future of manufacturing as well. So do look out for that. Otherwise, um, I think I've got th in good time. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And if there's any questions, I'd be more than welcome to take any of those as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham, and thank you, John, for fantastic presentations. If I can invite you both to come back on camera. Um, and then if I can invite, uh, if anyone has any further questions for John or Graham, then please do post them to comments now. Um, we haven't had any through just yet, so I just wanted to ask um, you, but ask you both if seeing what each of you have presented, have you got anything further you both like to add on delivering PMG excellence? Feel free, John. You go. Uh, you go. I, I, to, to be honest, no. <laughs> um, no. Not from my side, no. Um, but perhaps a, a, a small comment from my side. Um, I think it's, it's really the past couple of years has been a really interesting time in terms of um, really, I guess, a bit of a pivot in where we're investing our money in research and development 
me. But uh, there's also been some significant efforts that change in the kind of global landscape. Uh, net zero is firmly on the agenda now. Uh, coming back better is on the agenda. And uh, we can really see that we've released our uh, path to net zero, our strategy to get there 2050. Uh, now, which includes three strands, um, which are looking at how we operate as a net zero business, how we work, make our products net zero compatible, and also how we work with the wider industry and with the uh, governments of the world, I guess, uh, for want of a better phrase, to uh, to help this happen as well. So really interesting space generally, and uh, clearly the UK is well-placed to, to play a big role in that, hopefully. And I do appreciate that both of you got through your, your presentations um, quite quickly. So thank you for thank you for keeping to time. Is there anything in your decks that you that you'd like to comment on further or say a little bit more about? The, the only thing I'd, I'd add is sort of similar to what Graham was saying. There is that you know I mean we as a drives company we've been obviously as part of PAM, PEMD for many many years. So, um, but it's true to say that the over the last few years, it, it, everything's just exploded in this in this arena. And as I say, there's, there's companies out there, there's small startups coming through, and I think that the support that some of those are getting, I think, is very positive. I still think there's a lot to do in the UK. Um, I think there's there's huge gaps in skills um, that, that that is starting to be filled, but it's still slow progress. And you know, if we want to compete. And you know that's what we want to do across the globe. We we need to. There's still much more to do. Let's put it that way. Um, to be able to compete with yeah. with some of the other uh, countries that uh, have really sort of invested in this anyway over the years, and so they're they're switching on a lot faster. So um, although it is starting to make progress, I think there's still still a lot more to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree with us. Is there anything you'd like to add, Graham? Uh, I, I think we've got uh, over. If you look over the past ten years, has been a concerted effort to really pull the community together, and we probably understand what's happening across the UK uh, in totality for the first time, and it's probably the first time that's been done in such a coordinated way. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to have industrial drives manufacturers in the UK at scale, and what a good example of. Of, of how it can be done. Um, obviously, in our markets, we're more high volume, uh, sorry, low volume, high value, and uh, a different, a different piece of the puzzle there. But it wouldn't it be fantastic to see so many more companies like yourselves um, producing at scale uh, and uh, for the global market as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one, the one thing I'd just add to that is that there are companies willing to invest. And I think that, um, you know, NEDEC is one of them. Um, and I think that, you know, I think if the opportunities are there and the, and the business is there, so you've got sort of both ends of the scale here with Graham's and mine. Ours is a much more general purpose of application that, that we go into. Graham's is much more specific, but but there is middle ground to that. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's loads of opportunities. And I think, um, you know, if more people can get involved and through the communities that are starting to build up, I, I can see it. We, we're on the right trajectory. We just got to keep going. Yeah. 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 So I guess. Um, you, yeah. We, you've interviewed. Go on, go on, Graham. Go on. No, no, it's okay. That, that, after you, Hannah. <laughs> um, I'm pleased to say you've each got a question from Nick Weeks. So Graham, we'll start with yours. If we need power for electric aircraft and we don't have quite enough for a switch to electric cars, is the infrastructure going to be able to keep up to support your ambition? Uh, would it be possible just to repeat the question, Hannah? I did lose you momentarily there, unfortunately. No problem. If we need power for electric aircraft and we don't have quite enough for a switch to electric cars, is the infrastructure going to be able to keep up to, to support your ambition? Um, that's a very good question. And, and I think 
there is a, a balance in the pot of energy as we move centric view on this um, looking at the distances from our uh, nuclear and also from the uh, naval marine and with this opportunities for small modular Just, just until I restore uh, visuals. Okay, I'll proceed. Uh, I do think as well, if, if you take a look at some of the... Graham, if your bandwidth is struggling slightly, uh, do you want to stay on mute but turn off your camera? Okay, what I think we'll do is, I think we've lost Graham slightly. Um, if he comes back on, we'll go back to his question. John, if we can go to you. Yeah. Can efficiency support the shift of electric ge generation challenges over time? Or is the reality of growing demand simply too large for, efficient, for efficiency gains to keep up? And I can repeat that if you need me to. No, I understand. It's written. I can read that one anyway. Um, I, I think it's a mix of both is the reality. I mean, it, with electric motors, which is obviously where we're playing, I mean, it's something like 70% of industry, um, uh, of, of, sorry, energy use in, 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 in industry is, is from electric motors. So, you know, you can make a substantial saving by moving to variable speed dry technologies and to new motor technologies to drive drive up the efficiency but is it going to is it going to completely replace the need of of all, all the energy that we're going to need as we go forward possibly possibly not but i think it's part of the part of the solution okay thank you um, i think we've lost Graham, due to bandwidth issues, apologies for that. Um, he is trying to rejoin, so if anyone does have any other questions, please do pop them in the comments now. I think it's a case of hold the line cooler for a second. <laughs> Jonathan, what, just while we're trying to wait, could you say a little bit more about the graduate schemes that you that you do at NIDEC? Because that was really interesting to see that your graduates then grow into the company. Sure. So um, we're actually part of something called the E3 Academy, um, which involves Nottingham, Bristol, um, and uh, Newcastle University. And so we bring in something like two or three undergraduates every year um, and we we help them through university and, and sponsor them through university and then bring them to the business afterwards um, and for us you know working with that group and, and bring it we we brought in some very talented people over the years and it's the lifeblood you know we don't without these kind of people coming in we probably wouldn't have the the, the R&D that we have today um, you know we, we've had a lot of people that stay for a long time as well that have built up through that so I think that's important obviously you still you still look for any kind of talent that's out there sort of people with a bit of experience as well but it's I think it's all about a mix but ultimately you know it, it's a cliche I know but I think supporting the younger generations and supporting the universities and, and and being part of that process I think is an important one and it's the way to keep growing our capability here in the UK and in Wales of course the one thing I would say is you know we have worked a little bit with Avarice with University. We have brought a couple of graduates from there, but um, which is our kind of the local, most local university. That we are here. Um, so, from a Welsh perspective, I think there's more that, that could be done um, to support some of the younger people coming in. But you know, we we haven't you know with any kind of company that's based in a location, you know, with the manufacturing and the engineering around the manufacturing, a lot of the people that come and work for us are from local 
Welsh uh, towns and, and villages and things. So, so I think you know it, it, it's a good mix. But but overall, that that's how we've kind of brought the talent into the into the company. Yeah, at CSA Catapult, we're part of the Compound Semiconductor Cluster in New South Wales. And, and I know that we're working um, closely with Cardiff University and also Swansea University, where one of our speakers later, Dr. Mike Jennings, is uh, a professor there in engineering. Uh, so, yeah, that involvement with universities is really, really important because yeah. that's the link with industry as well. Graham, I'm pleased to welcome you back. I'm glad your Wi-Fi has has rejoined. Um, if you'd like to, to, do you want to pick up where you were on on Nick's question? Would you like me to reread it? Um, yeah. Uh, yes, please. I, I'd love to have a go. As bandwidth permitting. <laughs> okay. If we need if we need power for electric aircraft and we don't have quite enough for a switch to electric cars. Is the infrastructure going to be able to keep up to support your ambition? Yeah, yeah, ah, yes. I'll try that one again then. <laughs> uh, I think the answer is, you know, it, it has to really, but not everything is going electric and it's going to take a, a period of time uh, to see uh, things ramp through. I mean, clearly there's challenges in terms of local infrastructure as people move towards uh, more electrically uh, driven vehicles in terms of hybrids and, and, and full electric and clearly there's going to be an acceleration of that. Um, we've got similar issues uh, if you look at the ecosystem for aircraft uh, as well in being able to provide even at the lower power levels uh, relatively speaking the infrastructure that's required so not a simple answer but if you look across the market uh, electrification isn't just the, the, the golden nugget, as it were. There's also the use of sustain, sustainable aviation fuels or SAFs, uh, which offer a, uh, a significant uh, uh, strand in that in that story and pathway. And and um, you know, obviously, the other underpinning energy options that uh, form part of our um, transmission and distribution system today. Hopefully that's come through reasonably clearly. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. It did come through clearly. I'm, I'm glad you were able to answer. Um, with 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 uh, with bandwidth in mind, I think unless either of you would like to see more on those questions on your presentations today, I think we'll draw the session to a close. Unless you want to add anything anything further. Okay, cool. So um, I'd like to say a really big thank you to Jonathan and Graham for presenting today and to everyone who's joined us. Uh, our third session, to promote our third session, Opportunities in Wales for DER, will run from three till four o'clock. In this session, we'll explore some of the strengths and opportunities that are available in, in Wales with presentations from Dr. Mike Jennings, as I mentioned earlier, from Swansea University, and Rob Harper from the Compound Semiconductor Centre. We hope to see you there. If you have any, feed, any feedback, on uh, delivering PEMD excellence, please do let us know. You can email events at csa.catapult.org.uk. If you have any questions on today's content or would be interested in discussing this further or potentially working with us, then please email collaboration at csa.catapult.org.uk. And please do keep uh, an eye on our website and social media for our latest news and upcoming events. I will post links to our social pages uh, in the chat shortly. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining. Enjoy the rest of Wales Tech Week. <laughs>